day, fellow survivor. Welcome back to a new episode of Hammer D20, the show that makes a lot of its life decisions based on dice rolls and card draws. My name is... Oh, thank God. Steven Sobot, and I will be your guide. Today, we're going to focus on two things. First, a new card game made by a local Hamiltonian, as well as the Hamilton Film Festival. So earlier this month, I spoke with Michael Carson, the creator of a new card game called Critter Cards. For those who don't know, Critter Cards is a card game designed for kids, where you add up the two stats of your critters, their wits, and focus to make their total wisdom and face that number off against your opponent's critter's wisdom. The higher number wins both cards and adds them to their loot. The game ends when there are no cards in either player's critter deck, and the winner is the player with the most loot. Each player also gets a hero, which has specific effects that you can activate. You can play the game as it is, or for added complexity, you can add spell cards that add or subtract from a card's wisdom. But I can keep talking about critter cards as much as I want, but it'd probably be better to let the creator himself speak about his own game. So I spoke to Michael about what critter cards is, what inspired him, and what plans he has for the future. Steven, over to you. Thank you, Steven. Now, Michael, what is critter cards? Okay, so Critter Cards is a educational card game designed to take math for children and make it fun. <laughs> uh, it is a two-player head-to-head game um, that ages three to nine can play um, and hopefully find interesting. So, <laughs> excellent, perfect. Uh, so it's the intended audience generally is be someone for kind of like it's like a it's like a kids game is what you're impl- intended, it, right? It is a kids game, yeah. And it, and and I know I keep saying like three to nine, um, mm-hmm. which is. A three-year-old and a nine-year-old are so different. Yeah. The thing with my game is it has a dynamic rule set. So the difficulties can scale as a player's skills grow. So like a three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, their games are going to look a lot different than, you know, that the kind of the older, older audience. So gotcha. Yeah. yeah. I, I was like looking at what I've seen of the game. I mean, I, you know, if even if you're a 15 year old and you kind of like the, and you like what the game's all about, it, should, it doesn't necessarily limit it to you, right? Uh, exactly. And I, and I struggled with that too. I kept saying, you know, children's game ages, but I have fun playing it. You know, I'm 33 and I play with my daughter and it's still like, we have a blast. So <laughs> it's really not limited to any, you know, to any age. Um, well, I, I guess three plus yeah. <laughs> is, yeah. is what it says on the box. So <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah. And before I get too ahead of myself, uh, how do you play Critter Cards? Okay. So uh, Critter Cards is very reminiscent of war. If you've ever played war. Mm. So uh, in war, you, you know, you take a half the deck and I take half the deck on three, we flip a card and whoever has the higher card wins. Okay. So it's uh, it's, there's more to it than that. So you <clears throat> you join one of the clans, so the gnomes or the merfolk. I have four cards. You have four cards. Um, I play my critter. You decide what you want to play. So uh, each critter has uh, two number values, a wits and a focus. And when you add them together or multiply them or subtract them, depending on which version of the game you're playing, gives you the critter's wisdom. So the goal is to essentially um, win, I believe the board game industry calls them tricks. So you play a card, I play a card, whoever has the better value wins that pile. And those are points. So that's it. And in in a nutshell, there are extra cards that we've, that we added in for the older audience. So spell cards, which will change the values. Uh, They're trick cards essentially. Right. So, you know, you play a card and you're winning, you're beating my card. Then all of a sudden I have this, you know, this, this trap up my sleeve, right. That I can play Mm. uh, to change the outcome of the game. So. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, you mentioned war is kind of something mm-hmm. that kind of it, it it's similar to what kind of other games uh, inspired you to make this? So I'm a big Magic the Gathering player. Yeah. Um, and that is probably the game I play the most. And basically what happened was during the lockdown, like the first the first bit of the lockdown, um, it was me and my two kids and we were hanging out. And we did everything. We're so bored at one one time. And I was sorting my ridiculous collection of magic cards that's just in a shoebox. 5,000 cards, and they're useless because they're just all in a box. Uh, So I start sorting them, and my daughter walks over, and she was four at the time, and she wanted to play. And I I didn't want to say no, but magic is super complicated. Lots of reading, lots of math. Um, And I remembered I loved playing more as a kid. So I kind of like, but 
you know, if you have played war, it's endless. <laughs> it can go on forever. Absolutely. So I kind of just took some cards um, and made some rules up on the spot. And that's, it's evolved since then. But that's basically where it started. Um, we play tested a lot to make sure that, you know, it wasn't broken or that it didn't go on for an eternity. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, like war and magic were probably the, the, the big two. As you mentioned, uh, when you were organizing those cards, you mentioned your daughter. Uh, so yeah. wh- who kind of inspired you to design this kind of game, I guess? It, it, her. So uh, I just like, um, we, we love games. We love board games. Um, <laughs> up to that point, we didn't really have much. Like I hadn't really bought kids games because now there's six and, and four, but at the time I had a four and two year old. And it was like, what games do I buy for kids that age? Like mm-hmm. Candyland gets real boring, like not to not Candyland or anything, but like you can only play Candyland so much. Same with yeah. Monopoly. So, and I love fantasy mm-hmm. and my daughter, she's like my little shadow. She wants to do everything I want to do. So I was like, you know what? Like fantasy, a card game that would be compelling. Um, that's yeah it was it was both of them that kind of really inspired it so how can one uh support critter cards so the the best way to support it to help us get it off the ground is to pledge on our kickstarter so we have 30 days 29 to raise fifteen thousand dollars um so that basically will cover the costs of manufacturing um getting you know some kickstarter fees um and then uh whatever's left over hopefully you know we raise more than that we'll go into promotion right distribution trying to get into stores uh and then future development so currently um you know the kickstarter is the best way to help us out right now what are kind of like the uh the tiers of support is it pretty much your shirt so i i try to um make it as simple as possible uh and affordable because board games are expensive and i really i really wanted you know, I could have charged a, f- a fortune for it. So for $15, you get the game. Oh, you okay. get, you know, two players can play the game. Um, there's a rule book, there's spell cards included, you know, more basic for, for the younger kids. And that's the first base level pledge. And it goes up from there. So we have, you know, uh, more advanced spell cards that we've added in, in a booster pack. There's more characters um, that, you know, if you really love the artwork and want to add those on, you can. We have a hardcover art book. Um, just because that's the, the main feedback we get is how much people love the artwork by Alex Fleming. He's a phenomenal illustrator and I wanted to offer that to people. So, and we also have the activity book, um, okay. which is like a 20 page coloring book and oh yeah, it's like, you know, oh, there's mazes in it. There's cryptograms. There's like word searches. <laughs> so, oh, that's, oh, it's adorable. I love it. Yeah. Oh, um, and I've set up the Kickstarter that maybe you just want the game and the book so you can do that if you pledge just at that first level you can add any of the other things into your cart right so maybe you know maybe you want to buy it for your grandchild but you don't want the art book and you want the activity book you can do that excellent at our top level we're doing custom cards so for that six hundred dollar we are going to put you in the game we're going to work with you. We're going to, or, you know, if you want your likeness or, or your kid's likeness, grandchild's likeness, whatever you'd like um, for that pledge, you're going to get everything that we have to offer. Plus we'll stick you in the game. So, <laughs> yeah. So the intended t- timeline, you have pretty much a month to get there. Yep. Uh, afterwards, do you kind of have any kind of foreseeable future plans? So um, I've backed a few things on Kickstarter. And the one frustrating thing that I find is uh, some of the products don't seem to be done. They seem to like, which is fair. I get it. You need to raise funds to help complete things. Our game is done. It's been tested. The rules are written. We're just waiting for funding. So I'm hoping that this turnaround, you know, after funding that we can get, you know, the files to the production. And then within a few months, hopefully this will be in people's hands by November. Do you have any you know, you've kind of for future plans for other potential games? Like maybe Absolutely. something with role-playing? Absolutely. So um, it's very early days and I'm not officially announcing it because I'm still, you know, a lot of it will hinge on how successful we are with our campaign, but we are planning a cooperative board game that takes place in the critter realm. So it's going to be, the audience will be a little bit older. It'll be uh, work together 
go fight some bad guys, get some loot, get some items. Um, a, it's almost like a stepping stone into the more just dice roll tabletop games, mm. a more visual, um, but it'll feel much like that. So you'll, you'll, you'll get to see some of your favorite critters finally with names, right? They don't really have, they kind of have nondescript names, usually job titles. Like, you know, we have the Ranger gnome. So I wonder what he does for a living. Right. So um, cool. Yeah. Happy to hear everything about uh, critter cards. And uh, is there anything else you'd like to say before we kind of sign off? Um, I definitely want to give a shout out to my wife, Jacqueline Carson. She is uh, just been so supportive with my crazy idea. <laughs> she is a communication specialist. She's a writer um, and she's really helped with getting the message out to people. My, I'm not a writer, right? I'm a visual person. So, you know, all the great copy from our social to the rules, it's, you know, it's all because of her editing and, you know, honing in that message. So like without her, it just, it wouldn't be possible. <laughs> so. Excellent. That's so sweet. Uh, so I, <laughs> I say thank you so much for your time, Michael. I appreciate awesome. you coming on. Um, and thank you for having me. This is like, uh, when I like read the email, I was like, yes, absolutely. Let's do it. <laughs> Perfect. I was, I, I was excited to, I, when I got like the, the, the presser, I was like, I, I, great. The, 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 my producer was like, it's like, is this a little too young for me? Like, Punch. no, not at all. Like hundred percent. I, I love this as a concept. It's great to, 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 to kind of spread and advertise and say, yeah. here's the thing. It's like made in Hamilton. It's a new yeah. game. <laughs> <So> <laughs> yeah. get, get there, get, get there as it is and support it if I can. So Awesome. Uh, this has been great. I lo lo love talking to you. And I'm just going to throw it back to you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. And thanks for your time, Michael. Before we move on to our next segment, let's take a short break. See you soon. Welcome back. So longtime viewers will know that I've covered the Hamilton Film Fest before. But I know not all of you are longtime viewers. And since I love... Right. Platonically agree with you, I should at least give you a bit of a rundown for what the Hamilton Film Festival is. The Hamilton Film Festival is Hamilton's biggest film festival and has been running for 17 years. It's one of the top 100 reviewed film festivals in the world, having screened over a thousand films from 50 different countries. Since COVID, the film festival has had to work around the restrictions and mask regulations, leading to much of the 2020 film festival being held online. Last year's festival, however, was more open, as COVID had simmered down a bit, and you were able to watch many of the films in theaters as long as you wore a mask and was tested negative. So what does this year have to bring? Well, I spoke to Nathan Fleet, the Hamilton Film Festival director, about what they have in store and what else he has planned and up his sleeves. Stephen, over to you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, so, Nathan, what is the Hamilton Film Festival? Uh, well, the Hamilton Film Festival has kind of been different things over the years. Uh, it started off as simply a local screening of independent films, of local independent films. And then we've expanded into... Um, regional and then now worldwide. So we show movies from around the world with a, a focus on local independent films. We've also expanded into production. So we assist local productions, whether that be financially or with equipment or with a, a, a screening, you know, a location for them to screen. We provide, provide that for them. And also uh, education. Education has been a really big uh, expansion for the Hamilton Film Festival. So we, we do like watch learn, produce. Those are the three arms of the Hamilton Film Festival. It's kind of like an all-encompassing kind of like completes the circle of kind mm -hmm. of making and then getting the film because, you know, a lot of people can make the film, but then there's a lot of those things where you're like, okay, well, now what do I do with it? How do I make this better? How do I get this out to people? So uh, it's great. Great to hear. Um, I know this is obviously this is the second time I've uh, talked. Well, I, I think realistically the third time I've talked to you about the about your film festival thing. Uh, yeah. I guess so far, how, how is, uh, just generally, how is uh, running the film festival been for you? Uh, it's been great. It's uh, like, I've met a lot of people, mm. um, which has been, I guess, the best part of it. Uh, it's just meeting filmmakers from all over the world uh, and becoming, you know, friends with some of them. And some of them I'm working with right now on, on that, on the TV series that we'll talk about. Like, I think everybody that's on the series I've met through the Hamilton Film Festival. Oh, perfect. Um, and, you know, one of the selfish things that I said years ago 
was that I didn't want to have to leave Hamilton to go to see independent movies. I didn't want to have to leave Hamilton to go watch a panel of, uh, with distributors or something. So I thought selfishly, I'll just try to bring everything this way, bring everything to Hamilton. <laughs> um, so that's, that's one thing I've really enjoyed is not having to leave the city, but also be able to bring um, Hamilton filmmakers all these opportunities. In terms of, I know the film festival tends to have a theme each year. Uh, what is yep. this year's theme? Uh, this year's theme is sci-fi. Okay. So here's our 17th anniversary sticker. Oh, excellent. <laughs> There's our, so sci-fi is the theme. So we do show a bit of everything. Like we won't only show sci-fi, but that's kind of the theme that will run throughout the film festival. And uh, in terms of the kind of films, I guess, uh, categories, like what kind of films do you accept in screen? Um, well, in terms of length, it's short, mid-length or feature. So short tends to be the zero to 30 minutes. Some, most festivals will cap it, not most, but a lot will cap it at 15 minutes for shorts, but we go a little bit higher. Um, and then mid-length, anywhere between 30 to 60 minutes and then feature anything above that. Um, the European short films tend to be a lot longer. They tend to be in the 20, 35 minute range, um, whereas North American short films tend to be in that six to 10 minute range. They're a lot shorter over here. So we don't want to exclude any of these great uh, European shorts that we do get. Or, um, so we make that short category a little bit longer. Think about how many countries do you kind of get films coming from? Uh, 50 has been our, 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 the top is uh. where we, you know, we, we hit about 50 countries. That's been the most. But typically um, we will get the most films from, it goes Canada, USA, UK, and then Germany. And then, you know, a handful from you know 50 other countries um we get a lot from iran uh which you know I, we, we've we've been pretty pretty good to a lot of uh, iranian filmmakers in the past and i guess word has spread and we do get quite a bit of submissions from there so yeah all over all over uh last year uh i was like covered some of the some of the films in this and that and i i, I think it went fantastically uh but in your context how did it go in comparison to other years yeah it was great i was it was nice to be back in a theater with a lot of people we, we've always still been in a theater we didn't actually ever shut down mm. we we did we followed the protocols we you know those the two years ago we only had like 50 people capacity so it was really small but we still did it um, and last year where, you know, capacity was lifted. So we were able to, you know, sell a lot of tickets and bring people back to the theater. So it felt a little more normal. Um, so I, I thought that just that, <laughs> just to see people again and have people come out and feel safe, uh, watching movies in a theater was fantastic. It was great having you around. You, you showed up at every screening and did a lot of interviews and I watched your, your hammer D 20 show on the Hamilton film festival. So your recap was fantastic. So I enjoy that because it's nice to see other people getting use out of the film festival, no, which is what it's for. It's for the audiences. It's for, it's for you all. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Right. It's, it's supposed to be like, kind of like a, you, you get the community together to kind of, you know, to watch what the community can do as well as obviously what the world can do. But in terms of if you're to be a filmmaker, right. Um, what kind, what, what, well, first of all, what is the deadline for submitting films this year? Um, is there uh, anything else they should know? Uh, August 17th okay. is the deadline. We follow our year. So if it's our 17th year, the deadline will be August 17th. Next oh. year, it'll be August 18th. And then, until we run out of numbers, then we'll have to <laughs> figure out what to do. After we, get, after we hit our 32nd film festival, we'll have to pick a new <laughs> deadline. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Okay, okay. So this is August 17th. Okay. Uh, excellent. Uh, now you mentioned, uh, you know, doing the whole full circle dealio with the film, you know, with helping filmmakers. Uh, and you've mentioned a film school program you're putting on. What is this? So we are getting a classroom inside the Ancaster Memorial Art Center. Okay. So that's a, a, a brand new art center that's being, that's still under construction. It's almost finished. Mm. That will be having its grand opening this June. And we will have a permanent classroom in there. Hmm. So that is going to be a spot where we have all of our film camps for kids age 8 to 12, uh, teenagers 13 to 17. And then starting in September, we will have programs for people of all ages where you can come and learn screenwriting, uh, animation, cinematography, directing, just a whole host of things where there'll be either you know, weekend workshops, after school programs, um programs during the day so it's just going to be 
uh, you know, a full year worth of things that you can learn uh, about filmmaking. And we're connected to a lot of great people here in the city who will come in and be instructors for some of these things. And we're also doing a few things off site. So we just did something called PA Day, which we did inside the Hamilton Film Studios. So it, PA standing for production assistant. Uh, it was a day teaching people how to get on a film set, an entry level job uh, getting on a film set. So things like that will happen off site, but it's all going to be under the umbrella of this new Hamilton Film Festival School of Media Arts. Excellent. Okay, uh, that's uh, exciting. To, to, with the especially with that that PA day, as you mentioned, uh, it's always that feeling of kind of like maybe if you have the skills of being in that, but you like maybe a little daunting. Like, how do you get employed in there, right? So that's that was good because it gave a lot of people after that panel uh, confidence that they could do it. Hmm. Like, it didn't seem like a you know the film world. How do I get in? I I need to I need to know people and I need to be able to. I don't know, give up my day job to do this, but there was a lot of great answers. And uh, it seems like a very fantastic way to get into the film industry is becoming a production assistant. But you got to work. It, it takes work. It's not easy to do, but it does. The, the actual panel discussion made it uh, less scary. And for the film school, um, how is one able to sign up to that? Uh, well, right now for uh, our summer camps are, are open for registration. There's been a lot of sellouts already. We have nine weeks, uh, a, a camp every week in the summer. Um, so people can just go to the website, hamiltonfilmfestival.com and go into the school section. And that has uh, everything that, that relates to education. So all of our panels, workshops, camps, uh, things like PA Day, all that will be announced on our school page. I know you're working on this new show called Wild Child. Uh, can yeah. you, f for, I guess, new visitors who don't know what it is, can you explain that what that is? Yeah, uh, so Wild Child is a, it's a reality TV show. It's a wilderness skills challenge for kids. So we have teams of uh, two, uh, sp sorry, five teams of two kids, and they basically learn outdoor skills, basic outdoor skills that you might experience going camping in Ontario. So non-dangerous, it's not like we have, you know, they have to survive a night in the wild or anything. They have to learn how to paddle a canoe or fish or read a map or put up a tent or hang a, a food barrel in a tree, those kind of fun things. And they're timed against it. But it's very fun. It's very lighthearted. Um, but it's getting and inspiring kids to get back into nature and explore it and have fun with it and treat it well. So it was an idea born in the pandemic, and we just actually delivered all our seven episodes to uh, to the broadcaster. So it's ready to go. We're just waiting for a release date. You are finished, and you've delivered to the broadcaster. W where would people be able to watch it? Uh, well, it's going to be first released on 5 TV1. Okay. So Bell subscribers on 5 TV1 will be able to watch it first. And so even though the show is done, we're now in our discoverability uh, component of it where we need to get tell people that the show exists. So, uh, you know, creating our social media platforms and then working on uh, licensing the show to uh, addition uh, to other networks. And we're also in talks with a company in Australia to, uh, they want to do Wild Child Australia. So they're going to take our format and do it in Australia. So we're also working on finding other territories to license the format of the show. So there could be a Wild Child anywhere, uh, but based on kind of our core values and and look and feel i would say are you gonna start like do you have a plan to start on the second season or are you kind of wait until kind of things fall as they will we're thinking about our second season now okay. uh, and thinking about how it could get done um we did this i i don't want to say a shoestring we had we we were lucky enough to get a a, a budget from five tv one to put it on and then we put a lot of our own you know money and resources into the show um, so we'd have to, it, it took a lot of work to do because even in post-production, there was only two of us working on all of po all post-production on a multi-camera, you know, uh, edit myself and Jeremy major, uh, handled all of the post duties. So, you know, we want to be able to have a bit more of a, a larger team next time around. So the budget will have to go up. So we're just trying to figure out ways we could do it, but we're absolutely thinking of other seasons and other places to do wild child for sure. And uh, I think that's actually a great way to just say, I'll throw it back to you, Stephen. Thanks, Stephen. And thank you for your time, Nathan. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. It's 
all the time we have for Hammer Deep 20. Before we sign off, I'd like to share some information with you about Critter Cards. If you are interested in supporting the project, you can check out their website, CritterCards.ca, for information about their Kickstarter. It's currently underway and will end on May 4th, so if you'd like to support this project, get onto that Kickstarter page and pledge. Additionally, if you'd like to attend or uh, submit a film to the 17th Annual Hamilton Film Festival, you can check out their website, HamiltonFilmFestival.com, for more information. The festival will be running from November 5th to the 13th, but if you intend to apply a film, the deadline is August 17th. That's all the time we have for now. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I hope to see you sooner than later.